My name is Catherine Arndt and I'm the Chief of the VLGA Connect Studio. I hope you enjoy today's Connect episode brought to you by the VLGA, the national broadcaster on all things local government. Good afternoon everyone and welcome to VLGA Connect and another edition in our State Election 2022 series and we are absolutely delighted this afternoon to have Victoria's Local Government Minister Melissa Horne joining us in just a moment. My name is Chris Eddy and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the session today which is being recorded. It's members only access just for the moment uh, but uh, this uh, program will eventually be made available for wider access through the VLGA Connect channel channel. Can I, before going any further, please uh, acknowledge the traditional owners of a country throughout Victoria on behalf of the VLGA, recognising their continuing connection to land, waters and community. We pay our respects to the traditional owners, their elders past, present and future, and to their cultures. I'd like to introduce Catherine Arndt, now the CEO of the VLGA, to welcome you all to today's session. Thank you, Chris, and welcome, Minister. It's just a delight to have the Minister for Local Government with us today, which is interview three of the VLGA state election series. Uh, we're really looking forward to talking to the Minister about some of her priorities for local government. And it's really pleasing to see so many of you here today making the time to hear from the Minister and also to have an opportunity to put some questions to her a little later on in the session. Just in regards to questions, if you could enter those into the chat function, and then Chris and I will go through those. Unfortunately, we can't commit to getting to every single question, but we will certainly do our best to allow enough time also for the Minister to say a few words before we launch into that. But welcome, and I will hand over now back to Chris. Thank you very much, Catherine. Great to see so many mayors, councillors and even CEOs with us this afternoon. I'd like to formally introduce our guest of honour. Uh, Melissa Horn has been the Minister for Ports and Freight since December 2018, Consumer Affairs, Gaming and Liquor Regulation since June 2020, and since June this year, Suburban Development and, of course, of great interest to us, local government. Welcome, Minister. Lovely to have you here. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, Chris, for that warm welcome. And it's really terrific to see so many familiar faces around the screen and so many new faces too. Fabulous. So can we start perhaps just with uh, perhaps a simple question? What's your priority at the moment for the local government portfolio? Keeping in mind, of course, we're barrelling very quickly towards a state election. Uh, look, this is now, I think, week 11 in the job. And I've got to say, I am loving this portfolio. And the reasons that I'm really enjoying this portfolio, I think, is the ability to the diversity of the sector, but also to the, that ability to be able to work in a really collaborative, close way with so many people that are responsible for, del for being that first interface with our local communities. I think there wouldn't be a single person on this Zoom call that hasn't got into local government wanting to make their community a better place. And so to be able to work with that level of passion and that level of commitment to be able to say, how can I help you, is a really, is a significant honour. In terms of some of the things that I've really observed over the sort of three months that I've been in the job, I think there's a, few, there's a few things that really stand out to me. Firstly, it's around that important work that the Gender Equity um, Advisory Committee has done. And I can see some, I know I am only seeing a very small proportion of the people who are on this call, but it's good to see so many women that had a, that went to that conference just last week to be able to hear some really inspirational words, particularly from Julia Gillard, about the challenges there are for the sector and what we can do to grow uh, grow our representation of women across the sector leading up into 2025. I, some of the things also too that have become very apparent to me um, is that making sure that local government gets the appropriate infrastructure and support 
that really support communities, particularly in the area of emergency and disaster responses. I recognise fully that whilst there are emergency service providers, councils are in the best place to provide that immediate response. So to be able to partner with you and to be able to support and understand the challenges that local government has in this space, particularly as we're grappling with increased, um, the, the effects of increase of climate change, you know, many of, the, uh, many of the challenges that we're seeing out of that, it's really important to me to be able to say, how do I support local government? And finally, it's about having that, um, that good culture in local government. I think some of the things uh, that have been, I've seen obviously the culture review that's come out and working with the sector to be able to say, what do you want to be able to do in order to you know, continue to build on that level of professionalism that you've got across the whole sector? So they're sort of the big things for me. Thank you, Minister. Um, I, I think there's a few things you've mentioned there that we'd like to dig into. Catherine, where do you think we should go first? Well, I think before we perhaps go to the infrastructure, um, I guess, issue that, that Melissa, the Minister raised, um, we could take a step back. Call me Melissa. Oh, thank you for that, <laughs> Melissa. I appreciate that. Um, look, I think there'll be a lot of people in the room who'll be very interested to hear your thoughts and reflections on the insights report into the culture review of local government. And I appreciate that uh, the former Minister for Local Government had initiated that, but at least to get your initial thoughts and reflections and perhaps on where to from here would be very useful, I think. Yeah, as you say, you know, I'm, I'm very much aware that my, that my predecessor, Sean Lane, had commissioned um, that report or the PwC report to identify those factors in influencing culture and conduct within council. And I think it's worthwhile calling out too that we're operating in an environment that's been unprecedented and, present, prevented, and presented challenges for so many people in this sector. We've had a huge turnover of elected officials. On top of that, we've been doing it in, a, in the context of a global pandemic. So being able to understand and build those relationships um, across our peers and our colleagues has been particularly challenging uh, for so many people. And that's, at, I think, at every level of government. So I understand that this insights report, I've read the insights report uh, with interest, and it was provided that evidence to be able to create, to develop a whole of sector view on the next sec steps to improve local government culture. Now, I understand that last month, the VLGA met with MAV, LG Pro, and there's active um, conversations about what the next tangible steps are that can be done to improve the sector of both council culture and councillor behaviour. And it's important, I think, to that the response is sector led um, and it is well coordinated. Like ultimately, I feel that I'm here to support where the sector wants to go, uh, but you are all masters of your own destiny. So I think it, that whilst there is some legislative fixes that may be, uh, may be required further down the track, it's something that I think that uh, there's probably a range of things that could be done very quickly, and I'm happy to provide that support. Thank you, Minister. In terms of the... Uh, the relationship, I guess, between local government and state government going forward. What's how do you how do you characterise it in its current state, and where would you like to see that go over time? The relationships that I think that have been established so far have been nothing short of embrace. You know, it's very, been very embracive and been very co collaborative. And I think you know, start the way you mean to finish, and to be able to say. I will meet with anyone. I will have an opportunity to understand all of the issues uh, that are confronting local government and also to, to provide that advocacy across the entire of the state government. One of the things that really is apparent to me is whilst 
I am the minister responsible for the administration of the Local Government Act. So many of the challenges that face lo local government actually fall outside the portfolio of local government. It's in infrastructure, it's in housing, it's in health, it's in you know, education. And I think some of the things that we've been able to work together with to that partnership approach, take for example, early learning. Councils do so much of the heavy lifting in that space. So to be able to provide that funding pathway as well as that policy pathway for local governments to, so that they can therefore then deliver you know, the free three-year-old kinder with the additional hours, the free four-year-old kinder with the additional hours, also to, to have that infrastructure in, in space to be able to accommodate those extra kids is really important. Ultimately, it sits outside my portfolio, but I, I see myself, hopefully, as a conduit for your sector to be able to pick up at those important conversations and advocate uh, what you're seeing and the needs of your sector. Thank you, Minister, for that um, summary and, I guess, overview. And from the VLGA's perspective, we're very pleased to hear that what you've just spoken about is very much in line with the, the, I guess, the intent and principles of the Victorian State Local Government Agreement, which um, we'd really like to see reactivated as much as possible, because as you say, so many other portfolios and departments uh, within state government do impact upon the work of local government. So thank you for that. Minister, um, we're starting to get some questions in the chat and I'd just like to remind members of the audience that if you do have questions for the minister, please post them into the chat window and we'll start on those as soon as we can. There's just a few things we'd, we'd like to still get out of the way. Um, you mentioned, uh, for example, affordable housing as a key issue that is so much broader than just the local government portfolio, Minister. How do you see that working more effectively in future, given the challenges? I don't think there's a week goes by that we don't hear a council around the state talking about how big an issue it is and they're coming up with creative and innovative solutions. Is there is there a, a greater role for all the players here to try and tackle that, do you think? And what does it look like? Well, as you'd be aware, and I think this is a really complex problem or a really complex challenge uh, for us to be able to address. And it's what we need to do, I really believe, in partnership with both the state and, and local government. As you're aware, you know, everyone here, everyone um, on, on the screen holds so many of those important levers through, the, through planning um, approvals in order to be able to see affordable housing. And whilst the state government has got a huge commitment um, and a huge forward pipeline through our build, big build program, ultimately we will achieve so much more if we actually work together in partnership to be able to achieve those. Now, whether it's then, you know, providing those, that, that, that important planning that says, yes, there can be some medium density in some of our suburbs, or to be, and to be able to make sure that that affordable housing is close to those key amenities, whether it's close to shops or places of transport. I know in my um, past life, before I entered into politics, working for the Level Crossing Removal Authority, we were looking so much at that value capture in and around some of our important activity zones. So to be, I think that's where you can leverage massive change to be able to deliver those affordable housing solutions. I was going to ask a question about rate capping, but uh, I've got a question in the chat from the Mayor of Wyndham that sort of goes part the way towards that one. So firstly, the future of rate capping in uh, Victoria, your thoughts on that, and then we'll deal specifically with Councillor Maynard's question, which is more about high population growth areas. As you would all be aware, the state government has got the, has, has a policy for rate capping. And I do appreciate, and many of you have had very frank conversations with me about some of the challenges that rate capping uh, presents. I'd, I'd rather be very upfront and just say, we're not stepping away from rate capping. It is something that uh, we was, was a commitment and we will continue um, to adhere to. However, I, I do understand there are a number of challenges, challenges with you. And it's why I did things like red, 
for example, the Auditor General's report uh, into local government and to be able to understand, you know, some of the complexities around rate capping. I think it's incumbent on government to be able to say, well, look, we have got this policy, but then how do we work to address some of the challenges? And recognising too that councils in different parts of the state have also got different challenges. Whether it's small rural councils, it's like as you know, Peter is saying, he's on a um, in a in a council area that is growing significantly. I think Peter told me the other day that there's 130 babies being born every week in Wyndham, which um, just is mind boggling. So, but that too presents its challenges to then your inner inner sort of city council areas, such as the one that you obviously, Chris, would be very familiar with at Hobson's Bay and where I live. Um, you know, they they're all have got their different, different challenges. So it's being able to, I think, to be able to say to councils, well, where are the stress points for you? Whether it's, um, you know, the, the 50, 50, historical 50-50 sharing um, requirements, whether it's about saying in your rural councils areas, for example, where significant amount of their budget because their rate base is so small is then going on to uh, just basic infrastructure maintenance. I think these are things that we need to work through together to be able to say, where does state government need to support, whether it's through different funding arrangements or it's about opportunities that we can um, potentially change change a bit of the conversation. Um, g given that the, the policy is clearly not going anywhere, and I don't think anyone here would have expected you to say anything different this close to a state election, um, I, I note across the border in New South Wales, the rate peg there has been in place for some time. The government there has announced a review of that. What What is the appetite for at least looking at the way it's applied and the various conditions that underpin that policy to try and get a perhaps a more even outcome? Well, look, as I said to you, Chris, there is no, uh, our policy is very clear about the retention of rate capping. However, I'm always open to having the conversations that um, bring bring to me top of mind, you know, what those different stresses are. Councillor Maynard from Wyndham has asked specifically about whether some particular attention could be given to high population growth areas, whether that's a higher rate cap um, uh, for those types of councils. Is that something that would be on the table in the future, do you think? I think it's worthwhile continuing to have the, you know, I've had, I've had many conversations with Peter um, and certainly happy to continue to have those conversations. All right. I think we've milked rate capping for all it's worth. Thank you, uh, Minister. Catherine, would you like to take this in another direction? Uh, look, I would, although there was a further question in the chat about rate capping, uh, and it was in relation to CPI and, um, you know, if, if the, and I guess this may be a difficult um, question for the Minister to answer because, of course, it is the Essential Services Commission that recommends the, the rate cap um, but did you have any comments on, um, you know, would the government be supportive of that level of rate cap if, if recommended by the ESC, if it were to match what we believe to be increasing CPI? Look, I have not, um, I've not had any advice yet from the ESC as to what that looks like. Uh, so to be honest, I'd, I'd need to take that on notice and, you know, I'm, I'm happy to then once I have received some advice from the ESE, provide an answer to you. And, and that question was from Trevor Irino at Indigo. Great to see you on the session today, uh, Trevor. The other part of Trevor's question was was recognising the expense that councils have had to bear, and not alone, of course, uh, through uh, through COVID, and whether there might be some appetite to recognise budget recovery that would be outside of the rate cap. I'm happy to. I'm happy to actually have a. a a good discussion on that um, and I just appreciate that this is a bit of a one-way conversation um, in terms of the question being asked so I wouldn't mind understanding uh, some of the details around that in a little bit more of it in a little bit more granularity um, to understand exactly you know what some of the COVID response costs are I mean I, I, I'm conscious that 
We've tried as a state government to support local councils throughout the global pandemic through a range of you know, different support packages, whether it's sort of outdoor dining packages, um, you know, suburban development grants or a, a vast, you know, a whole different things of activation, support for local businesses, um, what have you. But I wouldn't mind actually picking that up and taking that uh, to the next level. And Trevor, I'm happy to come back to you or also to if, you know, Chris, you want to use the VLGA as the peak body to really sort of maybe put to me some discussion items around that. Um, I think it's worthwhile, a significant discussion. Catherine, perhaps one for the VLGA to take on notice there. Yeah, look, thank you for that, Chris and uh, Minister. And I would like to recognise uh, that the VLGA's president is with us today, Councillor Denise Masood. She was just having some technical issues, but she has joined us and is in the room. Um, there is a, I guess, getting off rate capping now completely. And we'll, um, we could go to the question uh, from Councillor Sarah Gilligan on coastal regions and emergency service preparation. Councillor Gilligan, would you like to actually speak to that question? Um, I guess uh, what we're finding is that as we all know, the world's changed and also the acceptance of emergencies is changing and we're looking at a lot more. And uh, in, in my ward, I've got a lot of low-lying coastal towns and what we're seeing is a lot of sudden growth because of COVID and the rush to the regions. So we're seeing a lot of building activity at the same time as our um, emergency risks are going up and I've sort of been asking the question I'm a new councillor so <clears throat> can we not sort out the emergency preparation before we start talking about growth and the answer is look if we tried to do that as a council they'd just go to VCAT and it'll all happen anyway so I'm just wondering if there is a conversation about how we interact with local planning overlays and what have you to get better prepared for emergencies we've just had a massive flooding and yet I'm seeing planning approvals go up in the blocks next door to it where we were cut off recently. Sorry, what, where's your council? It's South Gippsland. So yeah, okay. basically from Venice Bay all the way around to Welshpool. So we've got a lot of low-lying towns that are subject to inundation and a lot of growth happening at the same time. And the two things just ethically to me don't feel like they go together. But I've been told that because of state planning overlays there's not a lot we can do about it. And I'm just wondering if that conversation is happening at a higher level. The conversations that I've had and sort of the briefings from the department that I've had. So I've had conversations at with people at a local government level. Mm. And one of the first things that actually was impressed on me um, by David Clark was about that sort of first responder activity that local governments undertake. And, you know, when you sort of unpack it all, whether it's the Yarra Ranges or it's bushfires out in the, you know, East Gippsland or it's what you're saying with flooding or whatever it is, these are things we're going to see more and more of and more frequently. So being able to support local government in that first responder um, aspect is really critical and they're conversations that I've started to have with the Minister for Emergency Management. So there's that discussion going on. In terms of planning, I have not had that many conversations about that, but I think it's a, it's, it's a really important point that you raise. And I'm sure that's confronting probably each and every one oh, of yeah. you in your different municipalities. Um, so I think that's definitely worthwhile. Um, potentially we think about working together with to have mm. that conversation that with the planning minister. Fantastic, because it is. It's an emerging thing. We're all making this up as we go along, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Thank you, Councillor Gilligan, for the question. Catherine, we've got a few building up, so I think now that we're in audience Q&A, we should uh, see if we can deal with as many as possible. Absolutely. Uh, thank you for that, Chris. Uh, perhaps uh, Chris Meadows-Taylor may like to ask his question about ward boundary reviews. Thanks very much, Catherine. Thank you, Minister. Um, yeah, look, obviously, with the Local Government Act 2020, we know the issue of uh, 
the constitution of wards got, got a fair bit of attention at the time uh, and a decision was made and of course some some councils are non-compliant under that structure now there was to be a process of review and a panel to be set up that process seems to have stalled and for those of us who have some non-complying structures and are due for review it would be helpful i think to understand uh, from you just just exactly where we are where you see this all going look thank you very much and that has been one of those things that is very much um been sort of top of mind and being able to get my head around uh that sort of procedural that that procedural part of the requirements i'm in the process of setting up though um precisely that sort of governance arrangement uh that is that is required in order to start on that and that sort of those sort of decisions will be made imminently i, I fully recognize that councils really need you know what is it two two years out from the next council election we need to get through the state election but councils also need that certainty to be able to plan for the future i've had a conversation with the electoral commissioner about making sure that He's got the resources that he needs. He's setting up his own team uh, within the Electoral Commission. Yes, it will be focused very much on the state election, but he's also quarantining some resources to be able to lean in quite heavily to get this work underway. Thank you, Mayor Meadows-Taylor and uh, Minister for the ANSAC. Catherine, they're really building up. What are we Oh, going? they are. are I think next? I might need a hand, Chris. Uh, well, with OK, knowledge. I'll help you out. I'll, uh, I'll call on Councillor Trevor Greedy if he's uh, available to ask his question about black spot communications. Yeah, oh, Minister, it was just, um, we've been talking, I've only been on council for two years and, you know, I seem to spend most of my time trying to talk to ministers about getting better communications around the Grampians. We have a huge amount of black spots with communications and um, I was just wondering, I spoke to the federal minister and I was just sort of wondering what the state had planned to try and fix our issue. Like we're coming into fire season with big spring rains this year, we could have a huge amount of growth through the area. Thank you. And Trevor, and can I just say, this is why I really love this portfolio because it gives you such an immense grab bag of a whole heap of different um, challenges that sit outside your portfolio that you go, wow, I haven't really thought about that, um, but I do know how to how I need to help you solve those problems. So what have been the conversations? Because as you can appreciate, telecommunications, and as you said, you've had the conversations with the federal minister, like telecommunications are certainly outside my bailiwick. Um, but what is the what have the feds been saying to you? Basically, the towers are supposed to be coming, but for, for two years we've we haven't had any build at all and um we have tv reception and stuff in um falls gap um and there's a tower on mount william but um nobody seems to want to put any i think the last quote i got from was about five million bucks to fix it so um yeah that's sort of problem with basically out in the country we have trouble getting that type of um help yeah but mainly phones really that I'm sort of worried about coming into summer. And um, yeah, I, I just wondered whether the state government, whether I should be talking state government or federal, I don't seem to be getting far, that's all. Well, look, I'm certainly happy to provide that advocacy to the Federal Communications Minister on your behalf. I certainly am aware that um, I, you know, you're in one of the most beautiful places in in Victoria. No offence to anyone else, so apologies. But I have experienced firsthand the challenge, the telecommunications challenges that you have out there. Um, let me pick it up with the feds for you. And uh, just while we're moving into that sphere, That's um, right. I did I did want to ask you about? Um, the new Federal Minister for Local Government, Christy McBain, who spoke with Catherine and I on VLGA Connect last week, um, told us about the, the new government's approach to engaging with local government, which sounds really exciting, re-establishing the Australian Council of Local Governments, bringing together the state local government ministers uh, to talk about uh, issues and have local government really 
engaged again. That's the impression we're being given. Have you been part of those conversations yet? And do you see that happening from your perspective as well? I've met with Christy and I think it's terrific. We've got a federal government that is actively engaged and really invested in local government. And that is from the Prime Minister down. I think you've got an active partnership there at now all three, you know, between all three levels of government. And Christy is certainly, you know, as as a regional MP, she's and as someone who has come out of local government too, absolutely understands the value of the sector and the changes that you can make to each and every one of your communities. So it was really encouraging to understand that those ministerial councils we, where we can all get together and share some of the challenges are going to be reinstated because I think whilst we are you know, whilst we can all devolve to what is important for our local areas, um, it's important to, I reckon, lift your head up above the parapet and say, what are all the, what are the commonalities of challenges that face us across Australia? So I think it's really exciting times ahead. Minister, one of the things the Prime Minister did say was the a preparedness to look at the funding mix uh, particularly to remove the political marginal seat type approach from it. Will you in those forums be advocating for more recognition of the role of local government and perhaps a bit of a rethink of the funding mix that currently exists? I think uh, there's certain, and I would encourage you more and more strength to your arm if you can get um, more of a funding commitment out of the federal government. I wish you every best success there. Um, I think we're all facing challenges at a government level, whether it's been, um, you know, issues in the supply chain, whether it's been cost of living pressures, whether we're seeing, you know, and this is sort of looking through another lens as, say, the Minister for Consumer Affairs, for example, where uh, part of my responsibility is providing those funding services, say, for example, for financial counsellors. I think we're seeing more people in more stress than we have in many, many years. So being able to use our funding dollars smartly and to be able to listen to what local government is experiencing on the ground to be able to assist you is really important to me. So I think whether it's about saying, you know, school crossing supervisors actually cost local government more than they used to. We've got, um, you know, in different parts of the state, you know, and I'm going to pick on Peter Maynard again, you know, because with so many babies there, it's a number, that, it's just a number that's stuck in my mind. Um, uh, of the, you know, the, the pressures that's, at, that's putting on uh, maternal and childcare workers, or it's out in regional areas where there's so, so much of the proportion of the ratepayer base is going to maintenance of existing infrastructure. I think these are all challenges that we need to work through. Just setting aside the funding issue for a minute, although that is incredibly important and will be absolutely, I think, essential to be thrown in the mix. One of the things the VLGA would certainly like to see come out of, I guess, the re-established Australian Council of Local Governments, it's something we've talked to previous ministers about, is perhaps the collaboration between the feds and the state government across Australia to really um, talk to the community on the role and importance of local government, because I feel that that is a gap and not often, and often there isn't a consistent understanding amongst the voters um, who actually do elect councillors um, as to what their roles really are and also what the services are that councils deliver. So hopefully there's some of the discussions you'll have um, with, with your federal counterparts also. But going back to the uh, chat function, I think uh, Councillor Josh Fergus, would you like to talk to your question? Um, thanks, Catherine, and thanks, Minister. Um, Councillor Josh Fergus here from Monash City Council. I'm also a director at the VLGA. Um, I wanted to ask about something which has been very important in our local community for a number of years. We've been one of those suburban councils that has experienced 
uh, a lot of development over the last couple of decades, which uh, brings opportunities and challenges. But one of the things which our community has consistently told us is they are appalled at the level of loss of tree canopy cover. Uh, now, I'm aware that this is an issue at, at other councils as well, and Monash has sought to address this uh, by proposing a planning scheme amendment. Uh, we passed that at our council several years ago, it was subject to community consultation, and uh, it, it hasn't been approved uh, by the uh, minister. Um, the, the reason for this uh, that's been given to us over the last couple of years is that the state government has been planning their own pilot scheme, uh, which would apply obviously to a, a far wider area of Melbourne um, than to Monash. I was wondering if you were aware of the pilot and if you had any updates for when we can expect that to be implemented, because as I say, this is an issue which is extremely important to many people in our community. Thank you. Josh, I really thank you for the question. Um, and I've got to, I've, I'll be brutally honest, it's something that I have not been aware of. Uh, I'm happy, I'm meeting with the Environment Minister next week, but I'm also happy to pick this up with the Planning Minister too. I do know that, you know, from what I can say within my local municipalities of both Hobsons Bay and Maribyrnong, we're working very closely to be able to implement, because uh, as you can appreciate in the in the west of Melbourne, we've got some of the least tree canopy cover uh, in the state. So we're, we're working very hard to be able to implement, um, uh, you know, urban, urban forest strategies. So if, I, if I'm happy to either come back through the VLGA, if this is a broader issue to many of uh, the, the members or to come back directly to you, Josh, after I've raised that with uh, the minister. Thanks, thank Minister. You, Minister. That would be great. And thank you, Councillor Fergus, for the question. I'm going to go to Councillor Prue Cutts because I think this might be another one where those conversations with the Planning Minister might be helpful. Uh, Melissa, Councillor Cutts, are you there? Yes, I am. Thank you so much. And thank you, Minister, for your time. And it sounds as though you've got your head around a lot of things already, even though you've been in the role for a very short period of time. So congratulations. Um, yes, mine is also very similar to Josh's. Uh, Whitehorse City Council, uh, where the President Denise Masood is here. I know we've also got another one of our councillors, Councillor Amanda McNeil, on the, on the line here. But we, we're very um, conscious that with uh, Monash, Burundara, Manningham, Knox and Maroondah, that's the area of Melbourne we live in, there is absolute community concern on the loss of tree canopy. And I was wondering, my question was, we have got um, an SLO, which is a significant landscape overlay number nine over the whole of our municipality, which is not covered under other SLOs for the residential areas, but it has to be renewed every year. I think it's June or something, but we're waiting on the state government to actually bring in SLOs across the whole of Victoria. And it's it's absolutely essential. I mean, in terms of what we've lost, we've, we're losing about 2% tree canopy every, um, hold on, let me think, uh, four years. So about 1% a year or something like that. It, it's really horrifying. That's in spite of our significant landscape overlay. So I'm wondering whether the minister, you can shed any light on that. And I noticed that you said you'd be willing to speak to the environment and planning minister, but this is really urgent. So um, if you have any thoughts. Look, absolutely happy to pick that up. It seems so out of step with so many of our policies at a state level to be able to, you know, increase tree canopy um, and, you know, whether it's sort of phasing from the phasing out of native forest logging through to increasing tree canopy uh, throughout Melbourne's west, this seems um, quite, quite contrary to the policies that we're trying to implement. Happy absolutely to pick it up with both the planning minister and the environment minister. Okay, thank you. That's wonderful. Thank you. To move away from trees now, I'll go to uh, Shay Hansen from Cardinia, who's asking about the Living Libraries Infrastructure Program. Shay, would you like to talk to your question? 
Yes, thank you so much. And um, thank you for answering questions for us today, Minister. It's a pleasure to be able to do this. So thank you for your time. I have a question on behalf of our councils and I think um, many of the growth councils in reference to Infrastructure Victoria's report that identified the need to plan for more libraries and pools in growth areas. So with that in mind, I'm interested to understand if the government has any plans to expand the Living Libraries Infrastructure Program or if you have anything else in mind that you are able to discuss with us today. Thank you, Shay. And can I just say, when I found out that I had libraries as part <laughs> of my portfolio, I just did a little happy dance because <laughs> it is, I just, it is such a wonderful service that they actually offer um, so many people. It's that real equity thing, I yeah. reckon, that a library um, a library provides and when you see particularly the way that they really filled a space over of connectivity and that community um, cohesiveness over the global pandemic I think never before has the, the importance of a library been more apparent. So the Living Libraries Infrastructure Program um, is currently being assessed and there will be an announcement imminently about that. However, I can also tell you that I did make a very joyous phone call yesterday to the chair of Libraries Victoria to be able to say they'd been successful in getting, I'd managed to convince the treasurer to give me $2 million to be able to, so they can run a digital literacy um, program for uh, people over 60. So I'm willing to go into bat every step of the way for libraries because whether it's about, you know, them being there for whether it's a knitting circle that I saw down at Nor Lane a few weeks ago through to someone there meeting a lawyer because they were be, they had challenging issues there or librarians stepping in to help some, you know, a job seeker fill out their CV. They are the heart of our community and I'm happy to support in whatever way we can. But there is funding um, and we will continue to, you know, is, will there ever be sufficient funding? I don't think in any sector people will say, yes, we're comfortable that, with that because there's always something that we can do more. But I'm happy to continue to, you know, advocate and get whatever scarce dollar I can for it. Thank you. That digital literacy announcement has led to people testing out their Zoom reactions, uh, Melissa, you might have noticed. Lots of <laughs> lots of thumbs up and uh, applause uh, emoticons there. Um, uh, we've mentioned Councillor Peter Maynard a couple of times, the Mayor of Wyndham, but we haven't heard from him. And I believe he's got a question about dealing, or the, the power of mayors to deal with council behaviour. Peter, would you like to ask your question of the Minister? Yeah, look, Minister, um, we, we've had a couple of... Um, uh, times where we've had, uh, you know, codes of con conduct and gone through the process. And um, I am writing to you in, in regard to the response from one of the arbiters. I'm just having the letter done at the moment. But the arbiter, um, rightly or wrongly, laid the blame at our feet that we didn't deal with the matter internally. And and I, and I, I would suggest that um, in response to the arbiter, we'd be quite, hap quite happy to do that. But... Um, I think the only thing that a mayor can do uh, with, say, a, a, a council that has uh, inappropriate uh, uh, culture um, moments is to uh, throw them out the chamber. There's no, there's no, um, you know, carrot and stick approach with the appropriate checks and balances, of course. I really hear what you're saying, Peter, and I think this is this again is such a complex issue uh, and one that has become really apparent to me over, over the course of this journey. I think that whilst we have got the Local Government Act and you know, a, a couple of different integrity bodies to be able to support uh, code, you know, that, that, those sort of challenges, it probably is a fairly clunky mechanism. And through individual conversations with various councils and, you know, I'm, I obviously don't want to break confidences. It has become to me that at the base level, there is that, that really important culture piece uh, that 
the sector needs to be able to say, well, how do we actually roll that out and to be able to improve um, you know, some, some of the difficult behaviours that we're seeing at very localised areas because upholding the integrity um, and the community goodwill towards local government, I think is an imperative thing. Absolutely. I think there is opportunity to really understand some of the, the challenges that exist within the escalation of issues as they, as they progress, because at the moment it seems it, it, it doesn't necessarily seem sophisticated enough to be able to deal with some of the challenges that, that you know, have become apparent to me over the last sort of 11, 12 weeks. And I think that's something that's really worth having a more fulsome conversation about. Thank you, Minister. And certainly a lot of the work that the VLGA does is to look at some of those early intervention strategies and, and um, work with groups of councils uh, and councillors to talk about different ways of, of resolving conflict and working together. But that work, uh, I think there's an opportunity to really strengthen and build upon that work. Uh, and, and a conversation is something that the VLGA would be very receptive to having with you and the state government. Um, we might go down now to the Mornington Peninsula and I see we've got Councillor Antonella Celli in the room. Councillor Celli, would you like to ask your question of the Minister? Uh, yes, please. And, and thank you, Minister Horn, uh, for your time today and welcome to all Council colleagues and everyone in the room. Uh, my question is about um, how the state government is going to support local government in regards to social and affordable housing and also um, homelessness, which is uh, quite prevalent. The Mornington Peninsula Shire has declared a housing crisis um, on the Mornington Peninsula and we're, we're asking the state government to help support us with more investment in our region for the big housing build. Um, we seem to be quite marginalised in the investment that we're receiving compared to um, other regions. And also we have a, a peculiar situation where uh, we do have a state government owned public housing uh, that unfortunately, because the infrastructure has not been re you know, uh, renewed, they're not inhabitable and they're being sold off and taken away from our public housing stock um, on the Mornington Peninsula where we have about a waiting list of about 4,000 people um, on the Mornington Peninsula waiting for public um, housing. We have a large proportion of rough sleepers um, on our foreshore and we're the sixth uh, worst municipality in Victoria in regards to uh, rough sleepers on the foreshore. So we we are we have got quite an advocacy piece uh, to the state government to help us as a region um, address this housing crisis issues that we have declared. Thank you very much, Councillor, for that. And I was not aware of the those statistics, particularly down on the Mornington Peninsula. Yes. Look at a at a very high level, I can talk about, you know, the $5.3 billion that we've got for the big, uh, the big build in housing, which is about social housing and affordable housing. We've got $300 million that has been allocated to improving public housing stock. What that means for your uh, municipality, um, I would need to come back to you in that granular level. But can I also say to some of the work, and this is this again is through my role of um, Consumer Affairs Minister, because I've been doing a lot of work with Peninsula Legal Centre, and particularly mm. in the space around rooming houses. And I think this is this is an area where we need to um, really be able to improve the standards because. From my view, my point of view, you know, many people in a rooming house are just one step away from being homeless. So being able to look at, I've, I've sought advice from, say, the estate agents councils and a number of different advisory bodies, councils that I've got available to me through, as the Minister for Consumer Affairs to be able to say, how do we improve that particular part of the sector? Are there stronger regulations that we need? Are there greater protections in place in order to be able to improve that part too? Now, I do fully appreciate as well that many people uh, don't want a rooming house next to them. They don't want social housing next to them. Um, and so it's being able to move th through those competing interests so that you don't have, as you're saying, like those, those figures that you just um, quoted me of, 
you know, rough sleepers on the beach is, is just appalling. Um, so being able to work collaboratively with you would be terrific, please. Thanks for the question, Councillor Chelly. Now, we're almost out of time, believe it or not. We're really putting you on the spot uh, in terms of your broad knowledge of the portfolio today, uh, Melissa. Here's another one, uh, gaming. Uh, I'm going to pricey a couple of these questions to make sure we get them in. Um, there's a, a review due of municipal caps for gaming machines. Wondering if you know where that's at and whether there's an appetite to reduce those caps where LGAs are dealing with a high amount of losses from gaming machines. Look, thank you. And um, that, of course, is at, you know another, another part of my eclectic uh, bag of different things that I need to, <laughs> need to deal with. Look, that review, I understand, is is in its infancy. Obviously, we've been focused very strongly on setting up the new gambling, the gaming and casino regulator. Uh, we've had obviously the Crown, the Royal Commission into Crown. We've had a number of reforms that have, been, have come out of that. And in fact, next week in Parliament will be the last bill that will be debated in the House, which is about implementing the last of those reforms. Now, that puts in place a number of technical uh, requirements that are focused on Crown uh, predominantly, but there's no reason that in the future they could not necessarily be, um, be applied elsewhere should the government of the day choose to do so. This is around, you know, uh, carded play, um, cap caps on limit, daily limit loss, those sorts of things. I'm very conscious that since the return of gaming uh, venues being open post pandemic, people have gone back to those venues and that some of the losses in particular areas have been higher than they've ever been before. So making sure that we've got a new regulator and one of the key things that has been put into the remit of the new regulator is around harm minimisation. That did not exist previously, but now the new regulator has got harm minimisation as its key remit. So I think this is a conversation, this is something that will evolve over time, but I'm confident that there is the structure in place in order to be able to improve um, the protections for consumers in this area moving forward. Melissa, there's a question there from Councillor Leaney at Borbor that we won't have time to go through. It's Some of the theme is uh, stuff we've talked about in terms of funding pressures, but it does make the point that for some councils with fast growth, their DCPs were set some time ago when the cost, the estimated cost of infrastructure has been far outstripped by uh, inflation, supply chain issues, et cetera. And I'm sure you're familiar with the challenges that the councils are having in that space uh, at the moment. The question really is, what ability do you see councils having to bridge those gaps between uh, the real costs of today and the estimates that were set quite some time ago? I think this is a challenge that's facing, you know, so many, so many of our agencies and um, whether it's, you know, building schools or, or whatever, what you're seeing in Borbalshire or uh, um, around, around the entire state. Without a doubt, you know, we've got escalating costs and much of it is due to the due, due to supply chain, sorry, supply chain challenges, but also to that labour shortage. Uh, so I think it is about working working together to be able to address those. Perhaps one really quick one before we wrap up um, uh, with the state election just around the corner. We're hearing a lot about councillors putting their hands up to run for a state election. Are you being briefed on that? And do you have a sense of whether we're seeing more than normal? And is it something that you keep a watching eye on? I am aware that there are a number of councillors and obviously there's still a, a period of time uh, to go before nominate, you know, before we go into the formal campaign period and nominations close. Uh, I think it's part of, you know, the beauty of our democracy that we can have so many different uh, different people with that opportunity to be able to, to participate in democratic elections. Obviously, there needs to be that really clear delineation, which, of, which is a challenge predominantly for the CEOs uh, to be able to manage. But I think, uh, you know, it, it's about having a, 
a, a healthy democracy. Catherine, I might hand over you to, uh, to wrap up and thank the Minister, please. Thank you, Chris, and thank you, Minister. On behalf of the VLGA, uh, I would like to thank you for your time and also your generosity in answering these questions in a live panel format. Absolutely, as many of the people in the room today have acknowledged, that's a big ask when you have only been in the portfolio for a short period of time, let alone about to head off into a state election. So we do appreciate um, you giving your time today and we would absolutely welcome the opportunity to work with you um, in more detail on some of and many of the issues that were raised today. Um, to Chris, thank you for co-hosting today with me. Uh, it's always a pleasure to, uh, to do these panels with you. And um, to the audience, thank you for taking the time out to participate in this conversation. And many of you are councillors and uh, yet again, this demonstrates the, the commitment you have to your portfolios and your communities. So thank you. Um, and Chris, I'll back over to you to wrap up. Just to say thank you very much to the Minister for the generosity of time and to wish you well for the upcoming election campaign. Any final thoughts you'd like to leave us with, Melissa? Thank you all. I, I can't underestimate the value that I personally hold towards the sector and to all the work that you do on behalf of your local communities. I think this is a privilege to have this role as the Minister for Local Government, to be able to you know, work with you, unpack some of the challenges, but also to celebrate many of the successes that you achieve on behalf of your local communities, because each and every one of you, I think, contributes their all to making you know, your part of the world a better place, but also to providing that advisory across both your peers and to state government to say, how do we continue, have that you know, continuous improvement? So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister Melissa Horn, for joining us today as part of the VLGA Connect State Election Series. Thank you to all of our audience members for their uh, presence and their participation. Keep an eye on the VLGA Connect YouTube channel and podcast channel for more from the State Election Series. This is our third edition and there is more to come and we hope you'll uh, join us for those as well. Thank you to uh, all of you and we wish you a good afternoon. Thank you.